and namaste welcome back to the course on uh, geography information system we were speaking about base, uh, basic spatial analysis in the previous class let us consider the same thing uh, in this class we would look forward uh, we would look uh, into more of basic basic spatial analysis like overlay buffering etc and uh, uh, proceed with the more into advanced aspects the first thing that uh, i would like to look at how do you do a report generation then what are the different operations on attribute data how do you do an operations on attribute data some aspects of overlay buffers and spatial objects so if you are looking if you are looking at any context overlay and buffers forms a very basic part of spatial operations so let us look at it in detail and finally i would end this particular class with spatial objects and uh, uh, when you are looking at report generations from attribute data when i say report generation you are actually providing an information to the user right so when i am looking at uh, attribute data it's an inquiry into an attribute data is a very primary task whenever you are looking at js uh, uh, operations querying any data any aspect of data is a very primary task so this is applied as a gs operations when i am looking at telemate softwares of most of the gs whatever the gs softwares are available this is a very inbuilt part of any of those softwares whether it is qgis whether it is arcgis or any of those software which you are trying to use so it is a very in intrinsic part of any of the softwares okay report generation is uh, very essential in terms of processing uh, the data as information so in in uh, maybe uh, using sqls or any of the query languages particular uh, that access relation database can be uh, uh, mostly used and when you are looking at inquiry into based on logical and arithmetic operations a specific relational uh, database of uh, functions are used okay uh, the query criteria may be complex and cover several attributes it can be on single attribute it can be on multiple attribute it can be on all attributes in that particular table okay and there is no limitations for any queries it for example let's say that you are uh, whatever the attribute table that you have created for a particular vector data has 10 attributes okay your query can be on only one attribute let's say only on area you have created a number of polygons with area so let's say you are only querying on area it can be on area its ward its uh, uh, probably state and finally the country okay that can be your query or on all aspects that are actually there on uh, uh, the it can be either arithmetic either boolean or statistical whatever the operations it is it can be query on all of these so your query is not very limited your query can be anything on that particular attribute some gis applications support report formats that are tailor made for each applications so yeah, there are a lot of customized softwares for example arc gis has a lot of flavors when you want to uh, sub, uh, when you want to generate a report for a specific application if you are reporting for an urban application your report generation is completely different when you are actually reporting it for an hydrological uh, application so you uh, softwares have their own way of representations so uh, normally uh, a paid software very heavily paid softwares have huge number of flavors of this representations open source doesn't have much of classification in this terms but report generations can be made okay simple reports can be easily done some gis applications of uh, 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 i mean uh, some uh, applications may ha also support different thematic representation so that's based on the user you can uh, if if you understand the programming whatever is done in a sophisticated way can also be done by you it's just that you should understand how you code okay others use report function and report from storage facilities of the report generator supplied by dbms in use so by default there would be a report generator by a database management system so that the same thing is used most of the open source have have that specific attribute but uh, when you look at qgis today qgis evolved over a period of time and this uh, evolving has uh, brought it huge amount of flavors along with it so now today the qgis is also uh, in terms of uh, how well this particular thing can be done or how well is this more sophisticated as as in terms of 
uh, any of the paid softwares as e even uh, it is uh, you can compare it with ArcGIS, the functions of ArcGIS. So, most of things can be done using your open source softwares. Okay. So, this is about the report generations and when you are looking at complex operations on attribute data. So, it can be mathematical operation, it can be logical operation, it can be your statistical operations. So, this can be performed on any attribute data, but only thing is that what kind of the data you, you cannot uh, have an attribute data where it is mentioning the name of people okay, and say that I want to do a mathematical operation it, which cannot be possible. So, look at, uh, go, uh, look at the logic behind that particular attribute, why that attribute is placed there based on that you can do any kind of appli uh, applications, any, any kind of operations. So, including addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, exponential uh, uh, analysis, square root, trigonometric function. So, any of these applications can be done. So, these are actually categorized into an complex operations. The numerical treatment of a qualitative attribute data is limited to only counting uh, operations. So, that is that is only limitations in terms of qualitative attribute data. The next aspect is overlaying. Why overlaying is extremely important, why am I actually speaking it again and again is because overlaying is a critical part of analyzing different data sets that you may have. There may be certain data sets in a raster data, some data set in a vector data and overlaying is actually give you the exact representation of the data or data or the real world. Okay. So, overlaying is such data integrations and a technical process which can be used to get a rea realistic form of the earth surface in your GIS system. Okay. If you want to really get an exclusively uh, same representation of the real world into your GIS system, then you have to look at something like an overlay, create different layers for different process and when you are actually comparing it or when you are visualizing the entire process. So, if you can do an overlay then it gives you an exact representation of what actually the real process is. The first uh, point of overlay is polygon overlay. Okay. When you are looking at this, uh, it is let us say I have a thematic layer that is containing polygons, it is superimposed on another thematic layer which is again having a number of polygons, which means there is a thematic layer. Let us say I have created, uh, I am trying to analyze the urban situation or urban floods. Okay. Now, I have a thematic layer where I have digitized all the buildings, fine. So, I have another thematic layers where I have uh, digitized all the buildings that are closer to where you have uh, water bodies. Okay. So, now I have polygons as buildings in both the images. So, now it is polygon on polygon overlay. Okay. So, now I, I can look at either computing the coordinates of border in intersection for any of the polygon overlay. It can be uh, looking at how this overlay and what kind of uh, things are there. If let us say I have a vector layer beneath it which is a drainage network, I can find out which are the drains that are compromised for to develop uh, to build that particular building and because of which is there is urban flooding that is happening in, in a particular city. right? So, if the areas of whatever the polygons that you have created in each of these both images, so if it is actually linked in a topological model, fewer intersections needed to be computed thus reducing a computing time, otherwise your computing time will be extremely high. Okay. Normally, the new intersections are identified as nodes and lines between nodes are called as links in your polygon overlay. The new nodes and links form a topological structure. Okay. When you are looking at the topological model, it forms a topological structure. So, when you are looking at uh, this is one form of overlay. So, when you are each new polygon in the new object representation by a row in an attribute table. So, now when we go into the attribute table whatever you are trying to overlay both of these. So, now you have two polygons, one I said is completely buildings, buildings that were there for few years, other layer is the buildings that are very recently built with the um, lake bodies digitized. Now, uh, when you are looking at both of these, each new polygon that you superimpose, you have this something like both the images are like this. So, when you are looking at this, 
So, each object and attribute are represented by a column, the new there is a new map that is formed. So, whatever the objects that are added to those maps have a new column at in the uh, attribute data. So, superimposing or comparing two geometrical sets differing in origin and accuracy may actually give you a error. For example, what I am meant to say here is for uh, you have uh, created a map which is actually belonging to let us say an x city. Okay. And you whatever the coordinate system, whatever the datum that you have used or, or whatever the geographical entities quantities that you have used differs from the second image, then uh, you will not be able to actually give out or information that is in a true sense. So, both of them have to maintain the same geog geographical quantities. Once they maintain the both the same geographical quantities, then only you will be able to superimpose them and compare two data sets, otherwise it is impossible to actually get the real world quantities. Okay. The proliferation of small polygons may be contracted automatically by laying the smaller zones around each other. Okay. If the if these uh, zones in intersect when superimposed, then the lines they surround may convert into a single line. For example, uh, if there are number of lines, if they superimpose each other and if the, they can be converted as a single line when, they, when it is actually zoomed over. Then overlay procedure of a polygon overlay is to one is to compute intersection points, either form nodes and links, establish topology and hence new objects and remove excessive number of small polygons, compile new attributes and additions to attributes. So, these are this is how the overlay operations is done. Then points on polygon, this is the second type of overlay operations. Points can be superimposed on polygons, it is as simple as this, you have number of polygons. Now, I want to just find out how many trees are there in a city. So, I have the tree layer which is points, okay. then I have the city boundary, okay. I have buildings in that particular city. So, buildings are nothing but polygons. So, how many trees are around each building, if I have to find out. So, I have a points of those trees. I superimpose on this. So, that that gives me a perspective of how a city has a uh, number of trees and how actually uh, the bylaws, the building bylaws are respecting the environmental norms also okay, or how it is actually followed by the citizens who are uh, actually residing in those buildings or it is official uh, area of that particular resident. Okay. So, the points are then assigned to attributes of the polygon upon which they are superimposed. Okay. Each of these points are added as attributes. Relevant geometric operation means that points may be associated with polygons or it is the one that is related to the polygons. So, one of the approach is to compute the intersection of a polygon border okay, or uh, uh, border with parallel lines through points, you use points to compute it or attribute table is updated after these points are associated with the polygon. So, always any any operations on any data set it is the one that is updated with is the attribute data. Then the next concept is buffer zones. So, now if you want to have uh, buffer zones it is actually defined as a special proximity. Let us say that there is a city, okay, there is one city x. Now, I want to find out if the city has grown over its limit a threshold of the urban growth. Now, I want to see how the city is actually spreading towards outskirts. Okay. What I will do is that I will draw an buffer of 1 kilometer. Now, I will see how much the city has grown in this 1 kilometer. Then I will understand okay, if it has grown already grown in this 1 kilometer, then I will look at 5 kilometer, then 10 kilometer, 15 kilometer there may be at a certain part, uh, point of time where the there is no much urban growth in that region. So, that analysis may help me to understand how the city has outgrown itself from the periphery towards outskirts, this is called the urban sprawling. Okay. The, there are different types of sprawling, but this is one of the types of urban sprawling. So, it means to say that there is a sprawl across that particular sections of roads. So, this is what uh, the buffer zones can offer, it can say that how the urban area is actually even interacting with the regions just next to the urban or the peri urban areas 
and how this particular region is being affected. So, such analysis can be made that is why you need a buffer zone or let us say you have a water body and you want to find out uh, let us uh, you, you know what is the watershed of that particular region. So, which means to say that the watershed should be relatively uh, uh, with vegetation and uh, you should uh, uh, to understand that. So, what how much is the uh, maybe let us say 5 meter 15 uh, meters 5 kilometer or 15 kilometer or 25 kilometer whatever is the uh, rule you try to draw a buffer and see what kind of uh, infringement has happened as far as that water body is concerned. So, that such kind of analysis can be done that is why you need to understand that there is a tool called as buffer zones which can be used as a spatial analytics for various uh, kind of applications. Okay, these comprise of one or more polygons and of prescribed extent around a point line or an area it can be around a point it can be around a line it can be around an area. So, it depends on what kind of application it is. Okay. So, when, when you are looking most of the softwares today have an application with the buffer zones any of the software can actually provide you a tool where you can create a buffer. Buffer can be based on the way that particular uh, phenomena if you have let us say I have an uh, road which is actually changing its course. So, if the course is something like this you can draw buffer based on that course or let us say you want a uniform buffer of, of a circle. So, you can also draw a uniform buffer of a circle. So, it depends on the user what kind of buffer and how the buffer has to be done. Buffer zones polygons are also processed in the same way other polygons are generated during overlay arithmetic logical or statistical operations. So, the way it is applied is very different other than other than that there is exactly no difference from of these polygons in uh, applications of in the any of the applications that we may use. Okay. So, when in case you want to do an integrated analysis there are fixed procedures that are used in integrated data analysis one is stating of problems. Okay. First you have to state of what is what is the problem that you are trying to understand if the problem is sensible to be understood the, that is the first step that you have to always look at. Then adapting the data of for geometric opera, uh, operations what kind of data how the geometric operations are done what kind of operations has to be done or what kind of whether it is polygon on polygon polygon on point point uh, polygon on uh, line. So, what kind of analysis are you trying to do what kind of uh, geometric operations would be done and adapting attributes for each analysis what attributes you need and what is the, how it is actually reflecting on the information then performing attribute analysis once it is selected finally, evaluating the results whether that is very important whether you have to evaluate and you it is very important that you validate that result. Okay. If you have done it then whatever the data that you have generated is sensible otherwise the data that you have generated is really not working with the real world and then redefine and instigate new analysis if needed. Okay. In case let us say the validation data is giving a wrong result which is not coinciding with the data that you have the thing is that you have to again re-perform the entire analysis that you would have performed. It may be only the spatial analysis it may be the analysis from data acquisition to your spatial analysis. So, it may be anything. So, they are depending on what kind of output you get the validation has to be done once the validated you will understand what where you have missed in case you have not missed you would have got good results. Okay. So, very important is look at very 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 important part is how do you collect data. So, once you have collected data extremely well then the other part will fall in line. Okay. So, the next thing is analysis of discrete quantities. So, if you are looking at discrete quantities is how do you actually select retrieve analyze geographical data as a discrete value. So, when you are looking at this when you are any doing any analysis on discrete quantity always there is an effect on attributes. Okay. Uh, 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 when, when most of the spatial analysis are done on it also affects the size the shape and the form of the entities. Okay. So, when I say discrete entities it is discrete objects these are entities. Okay. Each of the entities will be affected in terms of size shape or form. When you are looking at spatial GIS 
special GIS starts with determination of spatial inclusion or exclusion. I was speaking about in, in the previous class only about inclusion. Now, it is also with inclusion and exclusion. You can look at both of these. When you are looking at interactions that are not limited to bound just the boundaries of the entities, but can also be extended to your include your neighborhood functions. For example, an aircraft distance, okay. then topological proximity, it can be distance over the network. So, all of these can be analysis of a discrete entity. Okay. How do you, if you have done analysis, how do you actually represent? It actually depends on what kind of analysis you are doing and for what uh, aspect. For example, let us say, if there is a work for BBM, BBMP is a municipal corporation, Bangalore, uh, uh, Bangalore Managra Palika. Okay. So, what road characteristic would you collect? If you are collecting the characteristics of a road, what is that you actually collect? Now, it may be your surface composition date of last resurfacing, it may be daily volume traffic. That is what is necessary for you to actually plan what kind of road has to be there and how it has to be there. Okay. So, that is what means by representations or let us say if, uh, if the same thing is applied in BMTC. BMTC is nothing but a bus company. Okay. So, it is uh, 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 it is a transport corporation which is actually a bus company. Now, if that is a specific problem, then probably I would like to know what is the timetable of those buses or schedule of buses arriving and leaving okay, at a particular point. Then what is the passenger loads in every of the sectors, how is the location of the bus stop located and what are the facilities that are there. Right. So, these are two different cases of representing in a different way. So, all the representations cannot be clubbed as a single rule. So, each of the representations have their own way of representing different quantities. So, every representation of a geographic entity depends on what is the purpose it has been used or it will be used. So, each user should himself or herself understand that what how the representation has to be, what is the use that he or she is trying to do and what is the final analysis output that will be done for a particular representation. Okay. Now, if it is a spatial object, when you are looking at both theoretical and practical use, we need to separate the first thing is representation object from its fundamental spatial characteristics. Okay. For example, there is a line on an edge of an area or a polygon, remove it, correct it. Okay. We must consider the geographical scale, the scale in two different uh, vector models would be very different. So, you have to look at what is a different geogra geographical scale, a Fairfax city is a point or a polygon. If you are, uh, let us say if you are representing entire India, so each city is a point. Okay. If you are representing only a particular city of Kolkata, that city is nothing, is a polygon. So, please be extremely careful on what geographical scale you are considering. Okay. Based on the geographical scale and the application, you have to choose what kind of particular representation you are doing. Okay. Objects are often two dimensional. We have to handle the height and depth as an attribute. Please keep it in mind, whatever you are trying to do will be a form of attribute. Okay. Our representation of realistic is usually reality is usually static, the real world is static. It, uh, when you are looking at a GIS model, it cannot be dynamic. Now, nowadays because of representation, because of the web uh, evolvement of the web GIS in a larger form, now it has, it is becoming more dynamic, but yet in today's context, in today's scenario, it is yet static. Even in a limited model, the number of geometric and spatial analytical operations is quite large. Even if you do a very small model of a single road, Okay. The analytical and geometrical aspects that you have to consider is very large in terms of spatial objects. So, be extremely careful when you are looking at different model and how the aspects of the model are being considered. Okay. So, this, this is about uh, how you use a overlay a buffer zone and how the spatial objects are being represented. So, what I am trying to uh, un, uh, un, uh, make you understand is that 
how actually an analysis is done, what are the different tools of analysis that are being done, that is what uh, I, I expressed in terms of overlay whether you are doing operations on attribute data or on buffer zones. And now once we have understood each of these operations are as different uh, uh, aspects, now the final thing is how the spatial objects can be manipulated, how spatial objects can be used in terms of analysis of data. So, that is exactly the way of representations that you have to have and uh, please keep this in mind representation of any uh, thing is very contextual it can or application based it cannot be similar for any uh, all the applications ok. So, and user it depends on the user depends on the application and depends on what kind of data that particular uh, uh, phenomenon or objective is actually handling it. So, look at that aspect and look at the representation how it is done ok. So, I will end this class by uh, these uh, special objects in the next class we will look at advanced analysis next two classes we will look at what do you mean by advanced spatial analysis and how do we do an advanced spatial analysis and uh, we will end uh, uh, this particular week with that. So, until then uh, have a nice time and thank you.